Number 10, Marie Antoinette, Madame Deficit, the last queen of France and maybe the last time royals got away with, well, being royals. Her whole existence was opulence, which is really just salt in the wound, when most of your citizens probably can't even afford a portion of salt because they're broke or because there's food shortages. Wasn't a good time. But if you looked into the royal palace, you can bet she's got a pantry full of bread and a bowl of fruit just ready for the pickings. She even had the nerve to purchase a necklace that if through today's inflation will be worth 12 million dollars US. Ooh, that's a lot of money I wish I had. People were starving, and honestly, if people don't have anything, including food, ooh, it's not gonna be a good time. Imagine a whole country acting up because they haven't had their Snickers yet. Well, that ended up sparking a revolution. Very confusing, and in all that confusion, both the king and queen lost their heads. Wasn't good. Number nine, Queen Victoria. Oh, blighty. Man, it must be nice to have a whole era in history named after you. Maybe I'll get one one day. The cheddar time. I don't know. She's, I don't know. Big Ched? We'll see what happens. Queen Victoria had some strange quirks about her. One that I can almost get behind, but not quite, is her niche for eating fast. Maybe too fast. I'm a guy who likes to make things simple, easy meals. The faster I can slip into a couch with an ice cold beer and a movie, I'm a happy guy. And or enjoy said food with the movie. Queen Victoria liked her meals to last no longer than 30 minutes. That means while you're on the appetizer, she's on the main course. And while you're on the main course, she's ordering coffee. Look, I respect the hustle. I get that. But maybe this is too much. That being said, are you going to be the one who brings it up to her royal majesty? Listen, if you want to see tomorrow's five minute brunch, you better keep it to yourself. Number eight, Cleopatra. Don't we all miss Elizabeth Taylor? I know I do. Sometimes, I wish I was her. Oh, she's just beautiful. Can you blame me? I honestly wish I was the real Cleopatra too though. All that power, and to not have one, but two Romans wrapped around her finger. Ooh. She was the last pharaoh of Egypt, but maybe had the most drama. Sure, Elizabeth Taylor was the most beautiful and chic woman in all of Hollywood, and she may or may not have had a few men wrapped around her finger too, but she never had to deal with the world's largest empire and her own throne, all whilst managing to stay the most beautiful and chic. I can barely manage to toast toast in the morning. Never mind all those affairs and, um, well, the marriage affairs too. There's a lot of, a lot of affairs happening. Number seven, Mary, Queen of Scots. I told you I was gonna bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy, every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're gonna talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there, that's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, diamond scandals. 
Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the queen, supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this $12 million necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number four, test drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack, and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again, well after the Empress was with him, and that made things a little complicated, but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti aka Lady of Grace aka the Lost Queen of Egypt was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Now alongside her new young husband she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power, we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle, and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her, and she wanted to find an escape, and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Maria apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people, and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally, coming in at a number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII, ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. 
Now she ruled alongside her young brother and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous and honestly, I'm the youngest of my family, I kinda get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis, reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria, during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen, because it was a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack, and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag, your order has arrived. Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later, but Queen Bess a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was opposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. We'll talk more about her later. Number 9, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number eight, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen of Ireland. Pirate queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There, she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones Locker with a legendary frog. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530, around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused, and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess. And not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused used to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number 7, Queen Isabella of Spain. Queen Isabella is known for a few things. A lot of stuff YouTube probably doesn't want me to talk about. Insert religious persecution here. However, I think she should be remembered for something else, something rather strange. When I was a kid, I would run around outside for hours, oftentimes ending up in the mud. My mother would always say it's time to hose you down, son. And she wasn't wrong, because I, I probably needed a good hose down. Now, regardless of how much dirt was behind my ears, I didn't want to wash. I was this big stupid kid, can you blame me? I was proud of the scruff, but that's because I was going to have another wash, most likely within the next 12 hours. 
I always got hosed down at some point. Queen Isabella, however, boasted to others that she only bathed twice in her life. Sweet Lord, Mary Mother of God, woman, that is not something to boast about. Due to some water access issues, the Catholic Church was like, ah, baths? Who needs them? You know what? Baths are sinful anyway. Being so close to God, so she doesn't bathe. Cleanliness is next to godliness, except in that time period where not bathing means you're actually closer to the big JC upstairs, so that's how it goes. Number six, Queen Elizabeth II. No crusts. Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch. God bless the queen. And God save the queen. Shout out to the UK. Chetty loves you. How you doing? Come, come and see me sometime. I love you guys. Now, sure, she's not the most awful spoiled queen in history, but she is a queen, and that does mean she can have things her way. Like, for example, all of her sandwiches have to have the crusts cut off. Yes, just like children. Yes, just the way I like them too. No, I'm not a big baby. I'm a big, strong man who totally doesn't rely on the women in his life. Pfft. No, what are you, what are you saying? Dude, stop. Mom, I love you. Anyway. Well, yes, it's true, the queen's sandwiches have to have her crust cut off. Is it the worst thing ever? No, I don't think so, but what if her sandwich showed up with crust? We don't really burn people at the stake anymore, so what would she do? Would she fire them, I guess? It's kind of a little thing to get fired over. I don't know, anyway. Speaking of getting fired. Number five, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chelonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chelones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Archytatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the T on that? Chelonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious 
his health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you, or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just a casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. At number 10, blinded by ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now, to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel, this corset poke off, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks, that should be a musical, not Frozen, get out of here. At number eight, no side bays. A bad relationship can really mess you up. Anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that. Not as many people carried that pain with them as much as Catherine de Medici did back in the day. Hurt didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken. She basically turned into the type of person that was like, if I'm not happy, no one else is gonna be happy either. 
together. Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress, and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry, and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time, and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband though, Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love. Maybe a bit too much. Hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work, even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around. But a thousand pound royal coffin that you have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you. I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death, every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number five, Queen Isabella I. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or a secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedigan of Soissons. Okay, I maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. Power. She went from slave attendant to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy, was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild, who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number three, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Technically not a queen. I get it. But she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. 
That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number two, Catherine de' Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father Henry VIII ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having delegitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift, gift, but if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay, it's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. 
Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't want to waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross-dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven, two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider-Man guy, that's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26, so so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standard, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war, and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs, and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned, like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just, you know, marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her way. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number five, Empress Irene. Mother dearest, most people have fond memories of their mothers. Maybe you should call her, I'm just saying. Mother's Day happened, you should call her. Empress Irene was a woman who wanted power. Honestly, who doesn't? We've all got a little bit of Sith in us, yes. Her son, who had naturally inherited some of her power, was growing stronger by the day. Now, maybe it was ego, maybe it was envy, maybe her son just took down her live, laugh, love signs. I'm not sure. But Irene was not having any of it. So when her son least expected it, she had two guards apprehend him and had his eyes gouged out. Now, being that this was before 2022, this was a critical medical injury. And after nine days of grueling pain, and when I'm sure it was a lot of blind confusion, the injury proved to be fatal. So what's the lesson here? 
Uh, blood is not as thick as water. Ah, I don't really know. It's just messed up. Number four, Queen of Castile. Life can be tough sometimes, especially when we lose the ones we love the most. Everybody deals with things differently. The Queen of Castile is a person who deals with that, well, very differently. People passing on was no rare occurrence back in those days. There's a thousand reasons on how you could wind up six feet under. When the Queen of Castile's husband passed away from the disease of the month, she was devastated. Rightfully so. That's rough. However, that being said, sometimes you gotta take that with a little grace. For days, she would not leave her husband's side, even after he was a cold cadaver. Later on, that corpse would travel with her, apparently even stopping a carriage once to get out and kiss his feet. It's weekend at Bernie's, except a lot sadder and gross, and uh, not a charming 80s movie. Ugh. Number three, Carlotta of Mexico. This is a new one for me, but an interesting story nonetheless. Basically, France wanted a piece of Mexico, and I mean, come on, who doesn't? It's gorgeous. Carlotta was a Belgian princess who kind of just married into the royal family and got plopped down in some chaos in Mexico. There was a war, enough political strife, to make anyone involved in the Watergate scandal start to look for documents. It was messy, it wasn't a good time. It got so bad that she had to go back to Europe and basically made the call that all university students have to make after fraud. Week. Hey mom, uh, dad, uh, listen, um, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Uh, do you think maybe um, you could send me some money? Yeah, I, I need some help. Except her phone call wasn't like that. Her phone call was more like, hey, European nobility, uh, can you come please save my husband because he's about to get de-lifed and like stabilize the country? Thanks. Spoiled princess calling. Hi. It didn't work out in the end. He got de-lifed, she went back home and, uh, well, she went a little crazy. Number two, Elizabeth Bathory. Serial D-lifers, your queen has arrived. I think this one is one of the more interesting cases in history. Usually when you think of a creepy D-lifer that lurk in the night, you think of Gacy, Dahmer, you know, guys like that. It's not very often that it's a woman and or someone from before the 19th or 20th century. That's just how it goes. I'd also argue perishing and manual D-lifing was a part of life back in medieval times, so kind of hard to quantify what is and isn't a serial D-lifer or life taker. However, I think she counts. The body count is estimated to be somewhere in the hundreds, and a most peculiar rumor is that she bathed in the blood of her victims. Ooh, that's gross. Bathing in water, that checks out. Bathing in mud, you go to a spa, that checks out too. Bathing in beer, sticky and strange, but check, I've done it. Uh-huh, I one time I did that. Bathing in blood, mm, that's a no cow zone for me, chief. While the bathing in blood thing might be false, the evidence of her crimes uh, were not. Imagine being so spoiled you can hide bodies. Mm. Number one, Queen Mary. Henry VIII was a big bad dude who wanted it his way. He wasn't the Burger King, although by looking at him you could tell he was uh, packing a few of those bad boys away too. No, he was the King of England and he had many wives and was spoiled himself. So do you think his children grew up humble and wise? Nay, kind sir and madam. Queen Mary took the throne a few years later and wasn't happy with the Protestants. Ugh, too many, she said to herself. Well, if you've heard us talk about her before, she'll probably come up again time and time again because, well, she cooked those people on a wooden stake. Over her reign, countless people felt the fires of her wrath, hence the name Bloody Mary. Number 10, Queen of Hating Her Daughter. Starting off this list with a bang would have to be the utterly despicable Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg, the Queen of Sweden. Queen Maria here seems to be guilty of the crime of attempted de-lifing. That's a pretty crazy thing for a queen, but it gets even crazier when you find out it was her own daughter who she tried to do this to. For some reason, when the queen gave birth to her daughter, who she wanted to be a son, she instantly thought of her sweet, innocent little daughter as a dark and ugly monster with black eyes. Gotta love coming into this world and being hated purely for existing. As she saw her as a monster, Maria tried to have her daughter dispatched multiple times and I don't know what this crime would be called, but she even forced her daughter to sleep next to the rotting corpse of her own father. Maybe that's the true crime here, because this is messed up. Number 9. Don't mess with the Empress The only powerful female emperor in the history of China has got to make you extremely ruthless, simply because you are a target and you would have needed to work to get to where you are. And you know what? Wu Zetian, who ruled during China's Tang Dynasty, was quite ruthless. She took her position of power by force, and she slayed many people in order to do so. But she didn't stop there. She committed more acts of slaying throughout her rule as well, 
And I don't mean like slay queen, although that does really work for this list, but no, she slayed people. And we don't support that kind of criminal behavior, even if you are above the law. To make matters worse though, it is reported that even her mother and grandchildren fell onto that list of victims, all because they were against her. Truly a ruthless queen. Number eight, mommy issues. Empress Irene of Athens ruled between 797 to 802, and she co-ruled with her son for two decades before leaving it all by herself. That's not a crime, but how she did so was a bit more, I don't know, just a little outside the realm of legality by today's standards. Her son, Emperor Constantine VI, was not a popular emperor, and the empress was quite an ambitious and greedy woman. She wanted full control of the Byzantine Empire, and to do that, with the help of some political allies, Irene led a conspiracy against her own son. Poor parenting skills if you ask me, but hey, the two actually made up and were at least somewhat civil. That is until Constantine divorced his wife and married his mistress, turning the people against him and giving Irene the opportunity to lead another conspiracy and then have her son's eyes gouged out. Yay! Number seven, Rana Valona. I honestly didn't know Madagascar had queens or kings. That's not because it doesn't make sense, I, I'm, just, I'm just dumb. Thanks to me being a young child, I thought the only royalty Madagascar had was King Julian. You know, like the lemur? King Julian! Like that, that King Julian? Um, but they did have kings and queens, and one of these queens was pretty damn brutal. Queen Rena Valona I ruled Madagascar between 1828 and 1861, and there is absolutely no doubt that she would do anything for her kingdom. After King Radama I, her husband, passed away, she took over the crown, and during her reign, she put a lot of people to the axe, or whatever way they executed people in Madagascar. Her uncle was one who met the sticky end to protect her power. But some records state that Rena Valona ended her own mother's life by subjecting her to starvation. Rena Valona sent her mom to her room and didn't let her have dinner. Or any meals, really. That's never okay. And would get someone like us charged under the law with something. I don't know what exactly it would be, but it'd be something. Number six, pretty firmly against cheating. Not to be weird, but I can kind of see where this queen is coming from at first. At first, I sort of get it, but not later on, just at first. Henry II of France had a lifelong affair with his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. And even while on his deathbed, he begged his own wife, Queen Catherine de Medici, to allow him to see her. Kind of really disrespectful to your wife, but I guess he loved his mistress too. I, mm -mm. I'm kind of confused on the morals of this. However, the queen was not confused on the morals and didn't give in to his plea. In fact, she even denied Diane entry into the room, letting the king pass away without having his dying wish granted. Damn, that ain't a crime. This queen had a daughter who took after her dear old dad when it came to the whole monogamous relationships, meaning she didn't really have them. When the queen mother found out about her married daughter's new romantic interest, she locked her daughter up in a castle and never saw her again. But she became even worse when she ordered her daughter's romantic interest to be executed in front of her. Now that is rough. And while she didn't do the deed herself, giving the order is kind of bad enough. It gets worse. Her son, King Henry, didn't like that she cruelly did this to her own daughter, so she had him dispatched as well. My goodness. Number five, Empress Agrippina. Continuing on from 48 AD, the next leading lady in charge of ancient Rome was Julia Agrippina. And right off the bat, she was already spoiled. Yeah, she lived a lavish life. Her husband was the emperor, of course she did. She had a family, but still, that somehow all wasn't enough for Empress Agrippina. And she wanted more. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors, of course, as one would. She believed that her and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, so she lied her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law just so they could get married. Yeah, love it. Gotta change the rules, I guess. We can do that? Okay. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, suddenly, just out of the blue, huh, oh no, Claudius passed away. 
Crazy, most people think Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. The Empress and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so she could, you know, hold on to that little bit of power. But eventually Nero got tired of his mom talking over his shoulders. He's like, you know what? No, you go to your room. How does that sound? Nero then had her forced out of said power. And Julia, as you could imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world she desired the most. And so she rallied a group of supporters to try and, you know, overthrow the power but plans backfired and she was expelled instead yeah i'm watching a lot of survivor right now and survivor we call that a blind side jeff here we go i'm so sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry told me i had to Number four, Diane de Poitiers. Diane de Poitiers was a French noblewoman. She held power and influence as King Henry II's royal mistress and advisor until his death. And at the tender age of 15, Diane was married to Louise de Brez, the much, much older and grandson to the King of France. They had two daughters, Francois and Louise. After his death, she took interest in another very powerful man, her childhood crush, friend, and the new king. Uh oh. Henry married to Catherine de Medici. Wait, like that, Catherine? Yeah. Oh yeah, talk about a bizarre love triangle of power. After he got clocked in the face and died in a jousting accident like I said before, Diane adopted the habit of wearing black and white for the rest of her life. Queen Catherine de Medici soon assumed control though, restricting her access to the royal chambers from Henry's deathbed and not even allowing her at the royal funeral. I mean, she's a married woman. Wives and their husbands' mistresses. Copying her style, stealing her man and her crown. She was exiled, comfortably. Like early, early rich retirement, spoiled. What do you think? Number three, Princess Margaret. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret, I have to mention, she partied with rock stars during the 60s, okay? I'm not gonna leave her out of this list. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this badass, I guess, in the media, whatever. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Yeah, Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry the princess. How fun is that? Also, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming, that was a wake up call. Guess my whole life's a lie. Sick. Hit that thumbs up button if you also agree that Pablo is more recent. Insane. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV, okay? She was a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. Now, in 1968, word had spread that the princess had an affair with nightclub pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who just a year and a half later sadly took his own life. And then come 1973, paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. Ooh la la. Ooh, big zoom on that one. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated. Yeah, she had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. Yeah, how dare her decide what she wants to do with her body post-death. Uh. Number two, Cleopatra. Talk about spoiled. Cleopatra Philopater was queen of the kingdom of Egypt from 51 to 30 BC and its last active ruler. From both Roman and Egyptian blood, Cleopatra accompanied her father, Ptolemy XII, into exile to Rome. But after a revolt in Egypt, his rival daughter, Berenice, claimed his throne. Ooh, siblings, am I right? What are you looking at? Berenice was killed in 55 BC when Ptolemy, her, and Cleopatra's brother returned to Egypt with a Roman military and took revenge. Yeah, more siblings. When dad died, the reign of Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy 13 was born and short-lived because arch nemesis Julius Caesar and him kind of hated each other. And yet, another war. Cleopatra sided with her brother's foe this time. Yeah, lots of switching sides back and forth, huh? Not a lot of loyalty in these families. I don't know. Eventually she cheated on him with Mark Antony, resulting in yet another war. After Antony was defeated, it led her love to take his own life out of shame and guilt. When Cleopatra found out about this, she poisoned herself following him into the afterlife. Yeah, that's loyalty. That's true love. The OG Romeo and Juliet. Also, Shakespeare does a wonderful show around the affairs and power of these two. Eternity was in our lips and in our eyes. Antony, act one, scene one. That's beautiful. Beautiful, lovely. And number one, Clara Ward. Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up quite the conversation. She was famous, but you know, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal. That's it, the rest is history. Since birth though, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband in the first place, okay? She was born into a wealthy industrialist family, but she would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, make it look good, shake some hands, get some photos. Hey, yeah, nice button, awesome, see you later. She's involved, you know, she's part of the team. But then she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman, Kimei. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back with him 
said wife. People were freaking out at this point. A royal married a common American girl? This is unheard of. She was the talk of every town. See, unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off her newfound wealth. Some loved her in her image, others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician, and after her divorce, she turned to modeling. So yeah, it seems like she was in it for one reason. I don't know. I feel like she enjoyed the clout, just a little bit, right? Just a bit. In our number 10 spot, we have Irene of Athens. Starting off this list today, we are heading back to the Byzantine Empire. Irene of Athens was the mother of Constantine VI, and while the pair co-ruled together for almost two decades, things ended in quite the tragedy. After the pair co-ruled, Irene did go on to rule on her own from 797 to 802 CE, but you might be wondering how she managed to outrule her son. Well, Irene, the ambitious ruler, wanted full control all to herself, so she asked for the help of some political allies to pull off a scheme against her own son. She began to lead a conspiracy against him to try and get him out of power. The duo did end up reconciling their relationship, but this is not where the story ends. In 786, the public began to turn their backs on Constantine because he had decided to divorce his wife and instead marry his mistress. Irene saw this as a second chance and once again chose to conspire against her own son. Honestly, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, this lady did not care. Here's where things in the story get exceptionally gory. Irene not only ordered the arrest of her son, but also ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Yeah. That's how good old Mumsy came into power. In our number nine spot today, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth was a Hungarian noblewoman who lived from August of 1560 to August of 1614. She was born into one of the oldest and most powerful families in Transylvania, and she was well educated and ran various estates and bore many children. Oh, and this is all happening while she was also killing young women and bathing in their blood. Yeah, weird, gross, terrible. Elizabeth is known for killing her servants and bathing in their blood as she believed it would keep her young. Guess no one told her about moisturizing and minding your own business. All accounts of Elizabeth remember her as a terrible, evil person. It is said that her number of victims most likely ranges somewhere from 175 to 200, but some claim it might be as many as 600 people. It is no wonder she is referred to as Countess Dracula. In our number eight spot today, we have Olga Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed, and during the time her son was just too young to rule. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out using scalding hot water. Yeah, don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. She is the ultimate ride or die. It seemed like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slaying, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from, she devised a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she was not okay. In our number seven spot today, we have Wu Zetian. Throughout the long and storied history of China, there has only ever been one woman who held supreme power, and that is Empress Wu Zetian. Of course, considering this historic feat, she wanted to ensure that she kept her power by any means necessary. She had all of her rivals killed, so anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The Empress ordered the execution of the previous Empress, as well as members of her own family. She had multiple methods of taking these people out, and rumor has it that she even had her own grandmother and two of her grandchildren killed for going against her. It didn't matter who you were, if you threatened her power, you were done for. It is said that after a while, the Empress decided to do a little less killy-killy and a little more lovey-lovey. Yeah. Apparently she started spending more time with her lovers using some aphrodisiacs, you know. We all are a little crazy when we're young, but as we get older, we all crave the simplicity and just someone to love, right? Of course though, 
people don't forget, and they were sure to exact their revenge. The people fought back and ended up having all of her lovers killed, and the Empress herself was exiled. You know what they say about karma? She does not miss. In our number 6 spot today we have Mary the First. Queen Mary the First didn't get the nickname Bloody Mary from nowhere. Oh no, this name was certainly earned. Mary was a Catholic queen in a Protestant country which as you can imagine was quite problematic when she ascended the throne of England in 1553. Although her reign only lasted 5 years, she made a mark on history in a multitude of ways. She was the first true queen of England and she was quite a vicious ruler. During her time as queen, Mary announced a war against Protestantism which left many who belonged to the religion being charged with hearsay. Doesn't sound all that bad until you learn that at the time the usual sentence for hearsay was to be burned at the stake. Nice. Mary was responsible for the burning of over 300 Protestants during her time as queen which unsurprisingly left her quite unpopular. Number 5. Julia Agrippina, Nero Maker Yes, making Nero should be considered a crime. But honestly, Julia Agrippina of Rome did quite a bit more than just that, and I can see where Nero got it all from. You see, Agrippina wanted to be in power, and when her uncle, Emperor Claudius, separated from his wife due to a scandal, Agrippina saw an opportunity, no matter how messed up it seems to both us and the people of the time. Agrippina seduced her uncle, became his fourth wife, and by extension, became the empress. But it doesn't stop there. She manipulated her uncle husband into making her son Nero heir to the throne and set up a marriage between Nero and her daughter-in-law Octavia. It's even rumored that she poisoned the food that ended her husband's life, allowing Nero to rise to power, which really bit her in the butt when Nero had her assassinated. What is this crazy family? Good God. Number 4. Queen Theodora Queen Theodora was scandalous before she even became queen. She was involved in theater from a young age, and one of her most well-known character portrayals involved her stripping down to next to nothingness. But her acting career slowed right down when she met and married Justinian I, who was the heir to the throne of the Byzantine Empire. The two of them were as thick as thieves and ruled together, but that doesn't mean she didn't have a knack for dispatching of those who threatened her position. She was scandalous, but she did way more good than she did bad. She set up houses for ladies of the night, worked for women's marriage and dowry rights, and banished brothel keepers from the Byzantine Empire. She was also a huge supporter of monophysitism. I hope I said that right. She's even considered a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church of the modern day. Killing it, Theo. That's kind of a bad joke, actually. Number 3. The Great She-Wolf of France Queen Isabella of France started off her queen life married to Edward II of England, who preferred the company of men to his own wife. This is obviously a precarious and possibly extremely frustrating situation to find oneself in, but she kept it bottled up and even gave birth to a son, Edward III, until it all came to a head when her husband found a new favorite. She visited France and had an affair with Lord Roger Mortimer an exile from England. But the better twist came when Isabella alongside Mortimer and a mercenary army invaded England, took the throne, and she became queen regent for her son Edward III until he came into power. She also was probably responsible for the dispatching of her husband Edward II while he was captured. Eventually her son would come into power and she was imprisoned for two years before being allowed to live a quieter life in retirement. Number two. Queen Fredegund. I was constantly double taking almost the entire time I was reading about this woman. She was crazy ruthless and all seemingly for the betterment of both her bloodline and the Merovingian kingdom. She became queen in the 5th century, marrying King Chilperic, and organizing the death of Queen Galswintha and sending Queen Odovera to a convent. When Brunhild, a big enemy for the king and sister of the late queen, swore vengeance on them, Fredegund brutally destroyed Brynhild's husband and sisters, destroying them as in that kind of thing. The queen also made sure that all of the other heirs to the throne stopped breathing, making it a sure thing that her bloodline would occupy the Merovingian throne. 
Her son, Clotar II, was only a baby when the king met his end in 587. So, of course, this ambitious queen rose up to power, fighting battles, quelling rebellions, and ensuring the smooth running of the Merovingian kingdom in her role as queen regent. She met her end in 597, 10 years after her husband, but Clotar II continued in his mom's footsteps, having Brunhild and all her descendants removed from existence, resulting in 20 years of peace. So it's good. Number 1. Cleopatra A list of scandalous queens would not be complete without one of the most well-known and famous rulers in history. Cleopatra VII Philopater was the last pharaoh Egypt ever had, reigning from 51 to 30 BC. Her life was full of scandal. When she first came into power, she was co-ruler with her husband and brother, Ptolemy XIII. But that didn't last very long as the two did not see eye to eye and it started a huge civil war in the country. At the same time, a conflict from Rome made its way to Egypt as well, resulting in Julius Caesar allegedly being seduced by Cleopatra and helping her end her brother's life. And again, being co-ruler with another of her brothers, also named Ptolemy, and ending the life of one of her sisters. She was also having an affair with Caesar and even produced a son with him, who became co-ruler with her after Caesar's death and after her other brother was seemingly assassinated. I'm so glad I was not a part of these families. Just death and betrayal everywhere. She then went on to seduce second Roman triumvirate member Mark Anthony and sided with him when Octavian and Mark Anthony engaged in the final war of the Roman Republic which Anthony lost, fighting with and alongside him until she poisoned herself to avoid being paraded through Rome and executed by the victorious Octavian. Number 10, Irene of Athens. First off, it's safe to say that all these people were a little spoiled. Like the royal family times a thousand. When you're named after cities, you were like rich rich. Irene of Athens was Byzantine's empress to Emperor Leo IV and co-ruler from 792 until 797. Mother to son Constantine VI and sole ruler of the Eastern Roman Empire. Yeah, that's quite a resume, Irene. The quote, untimely death, okay, of her husband caused the throne to fall to her. Interesting. Although when Irene's son Constantine was a teen, several revolts tried to make him sole ruler. Mom caught on in 797, and Irene gouged out both of her son's eyes and imprisoned him, dying shortly after. Talk about grounded, dude. Mom's in that unconditional love, huh? A revolt years later overthrew Irene and exiled her to a remote island where Irene died months later. History's dark, huh? She's like, I'm gonna count to three, and then I'm gonna rip out your eyes. One? Two. Number nine, Valeria Messalina. Turning the clocks back to 17, you know, the year 17, just 17 AD, a classic. That in 2016, solid years. Metaphorically and literally, ancient Romans paved the way for following civilizations. They achieved some groundbreaking stuff in their time, but the empress of the Romans at that time, from 17 AD to 48 AD, Valeria Messalina, well, she was too focused on a more lavish business rather than ruling over armies at that time. Many accounts in history can confirm this. Pliny the Elder wrote about it as well, so you know it's the... Real deal. Valeria, she owned a big fancy house where ladies of the evening would come and go. She made a lot of money. This is where the finest ladies who weren't even involved in that kind of lifestyle or that kind of business, this is where they changed their minds. Know what I mean? It was a big deal. She was changing the game. Because of Valeria and the operation she was running, sometimes Valeria herself would participate in these games. Yeah, contests, if I may, to see who could tango with the most people in one night. Yeah, Valeria hit 25 in one night, so yeah, I'd say she ruined a few parties for sure. I mean, her husband, Emperor Claudius, would at least agree, no? Number eight, Catherine de Medici. Catherine de Medici was an Italian noblewoman born into a famous, famous family. She was queen of France from 1547 to 1559 with marriage to King Henry II and mother of four future French kings, Francis II, Charles IX, Henry Henry the third. The years during which all her sons reigned have been called the age of Catherine de Medici, as she has extensive influence in politics in France at the time. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, she raised those boys. She was like the secret hand making all the decisions, but she was cool and subtle. She's basically the Kris Jenner of her time. She married Henry, second son of King Francis, and after the king took part in some friendly jousting, he was smashed in the face and the splinters took his life days later. Ouch. Catherine then and her frail 15-year-old son were king and queen. When he died, she took power again till her 10-year-old son was ready. After that, he died. Same thing for the third son. The age expectancy was abysmal back then. She ruled with her youngest until her illness in her late 40s. 
Hmm. Number seven, Queen Rana Valona the first, the last queen of Madagascar. Where to begin? Queen Rana Valona, one of the worst in history. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was cruel, violent, and would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with power. It's pretty sad. In the late 1700s, the king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him, as everywhere that happens. And the king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. Okay. The king repaid said local by adopting his daughter, his daughter being Rana Valona. And now she was set to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Valona the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized, of course, that she, you know, poisoned him, so that's probable and horrible. Rana Valona kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Yeah, just to give you an idea of how she handled things. Yuck. Number six, Bloody Mary. England's first female monarch, Mary I, ruled for just five years. The only surviving child of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. Mary took the throne after the brief reign of her half-brother. They say she was an evil queen, but after doing my homework, yeah, I'd have some chips on my shoulders as well. Married at nine and 11? Everyone's just yelling at you because you're too young to have kids? Yeah, that's awful. She was promoted and demoted so many times, no wonder she did what she did. Every time she was close to the throne, all of a sudden her family tree was just like rearranged by law. Her dad decided to go down the other family route. Nice, nice. She's infamously remembered for burning 300 English Protestants at the stake, which earned her the nickname Bloody Mary. Her brother found a loophole with religion, so she was like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, light him up. She's also famously remembered as teaming up with her half-sister, Elizabeth I, and ruling together as sisters, making them the first two British queens. She was spoiled from birth, but she's kind of a badass. Anyone that did her harm, past or present, they were either sent to the tower or the chopping block. Checkmate. Number five may have not gone mad, but it was her favorite emotion, Empress Anna of Russia. She is remembered as a horrible and spiteful child with a cruelty streak. Young Anna it was reported to be mannerless and vulgar. So when her father, who experienced a stroke shortly after her birth that left him handicapped, passed away, her very traditional mother attempted to raise her in classic elements of strict religious femininity, so she may be a quiet and obedient woman. Anna had other plans. She hunted animals, kept guns and swords, and terrorized other children as well as the commoners. This behavior was all a massive red flag for some of the crazy things she'd do later in life when granted power and the means. Anna's only husband ever was Frederick Williams, who at their reception indulged a little too heavy on alcohol and gave him a hangover so wicked that three days later he just died. In 1730, her uncle Peter the Great passed. The Privy Council turned her into the Empress of all of Russia since she was widowed and childless, which was assumed to cause less trouble. The joke's on them because she turned around and and immediately abolished the Supreme Privy Council and re-established the autocracy. Now she had the sole power, and while she made some serious political waves, Anna also made some strange choices. She has a serious vendetta with Peter the Great's daughter Elizabeth, her cousin. Elizabeth was a better looking, younger, and also a rival for her throne. So she ruined her life. No nobleman could marry Elizabeth. If Elizabeth chose a commoner, the Empress would strip her of her titles and her claim to the throne. When Anna found out about Elizabeth's side, Peace, the unhinged empress ordered her men to cut out his tongue and exiled him to Serbia. Anna even woke up one morning and decided to force Prince Mikhail to marry her lower class older maid as a joke. After the ceremony wrapped up, Anna placed the prince, Mikhail, and the maid in a cage, dressed them as clowns, and paraded them on top of an elephant to an ice palace she had constructed for their honeymoon. In the extreme cold of Russia, she reportedly advised them to get to doing the dirty with each other if they wanted to keep their bodies warm enough to stay alive. Maria Eleonora wasn't the only queen who couldn't give up on a dead relationship, pun intended. Number four is Joanna of Castile. Never meant to be a princess, let alone a queen, Joanna earned her title and nickname Joanna La Loca through unfortunate means. She had two older siblings, Isabella who passed in 1498 and Joan in 1497. Joanna's mother, the formidable Catholic monarch Isabella I of Castile, passed away in 1504. This left the throne to, of Castile and Lyon to Joanna when her father passed in 1517. Joanna had started exhibiting signs of mental instability 
instability in 1504 when her mother had been sick. She was struggling to eat or sleep and having outbursts of anger. One such example was when she wished to go see her husband in Flanders, the journey would take her through France, which Castile were at war with at the time. When she was prevented from leading for Flanders, 24 year old Joanna flew into a rage. Perhaps one of Joanna's most notable displays of mental instability occurred when her husband died in 1506. Joanna refused to part with her deceased husband's remains for a disturbingly long time, reportedly opening the casket to kiss or embrace him. I'm seeing a pattern here with some of these women. While pregnant, Joanna traveled with her husband's body from Burgos to Granada, a distance of 668 kilometers, which would take around six and a half hours to drive in a car today. And talk about a romantic imbalance, while she did all of this posthumously, when her husband Philip was alive, he talked Joanna's madness to anyone that would listen and completely discredited the woman. In 1509, Joanna was placed in the royal monastery slash covenant of Santa Clara and Tostillas, Castile, by her son Charles, who also forbade Joanna to have any visitors until her passing. The most recognizable name on our list is Marie Antoinette, who is number three in our countdown. Married at only 14, Marie was known to have lived an opulent lifestyle, but there was a lot of conspiracy and debate about the young woman. She was performing what she knew her royal duties to be, and she was known for not always being the most educated. She started the trend of riding donkeys and the worldwide trend of feathered slash stuffed bird hats. She even once had an entire miniature village created with functioning shops so that she and other elites may dress like commoners and experience living lower status. Marie was misguided and young, but she was also the victim of an incredible smear campaign. She was accused of having ulterior motives constantly, supplying the Austrians with military plans or siphoning millions of livres of treasury money to Austria. It was the tales of sexual deviance that were the most damaging though. Alleged to have had orgies, laid with commoners, or even have sex with her own ladies in waiting. Her most offensive accusal was thrown at her in trial before her famous decapitation where she was accused of committing indiscretions with her own child Louise Charles. With such a vast array of accusations against her, not one of which was supported by any concrete evidence, the trial was a formality, conceived merely as a step towards completing the revolution. Marie Antoinette was declared guilty and executed only hours later at the age of 37. Speaking of sexual deviance, meet Queen Anna Nzinga, who is number two in our countdown. Queen of what's now known as present day Angola, Anna took the crown when her brother passed away. Being queen of Angola was hard work. Anna managed to keep the Portuguese invaders out for over 40 years alone. So how would you, a tough and titanous queen, decompress? Why by building a harem, of course. Anna collected the men she found to be the most attractive warriors in her region, keeping a harem of 50 to 60 men close at hand for whenever she, well, wanted a romp in the sack. Spending a great deal of her time strategizing her on battlefield in men's apparel, some historians wonder if that's why she required the men in her harem to dress as women. Now Anna didn't have time to deal with picking who she was going to sleep with every night, so she devised a unique system. Anna would just have the two men who desired her the most that evening fight to the death every night and then bed the winner. The next day, the winner still loses as she would have them executed. Anna disbanded her harem at 75 when she took on her teenage husband, cementing her status as not only a serious badass who liberated her people and established dominance in an era of men, but also as a cougar. The next queen fought her way to the top of the countdown. Number one is Queen Rananavola the first. During her reign of Madagascar, Queen Rananavola the first is remembered as a dangerous tyrant who ruled her island nation with cruelty and an iron fist. Rananavola was a merciless to those who tried to colonize her nation, but also to those inhabiting it. Should crimes, disputes, or discourse arise, Rananavola had a nifty trick to solve it called trial by ordeal. Both parties would be forced to ingest three pieces of chicken skin alongside a poison taken from a native plant, Tangana. Throw up your chicken skins and you're proclaimed innocent, hooray! If you didn't, you were guilty and be put to death, if the poison didn't kill you first. This trial was one of the punishments used in her persecution of Christian colonists, alongside throwing people into rock quarries and live dismemberments. Her horrific list really will go on. Rana Lavona was such a deadly tyrant that the queen managed to reduce her country's population from 5 million people in 1833 to 2.5 million in 1839. All through means of war, executions, religious persecution, or just settling scores. Depicted as a deranged tyrant even after her death in 1861, many have tried to repaint her image as one of a driven ruler trying to keep her culture and country independent from those trying to grow their own selfish empires. What's your take? Number 10, Boudicca. She was very tall, the glance of her eye most fierce, her voice harsh. A great mass of the reddest hair fell down to her hips. Her appearance was terrifying. Sounds awesome to me. 
One of the most famous queens in British history, Queen Boudicca was originally co-ruler of the Iceni tribe of East Anglia, alongside her husband, King Prasitagus. That is, she was until the Roman governor of Britain at the time attacked. Prasitagus was killed and his lands and household were plundered by the Romans. Boudicca and her daughters were rather savagely treated as well. So much so that after the fact she rose up leading other tribes of Britons who banded together and decided to take the fight back to the Romans. The Britons captured the Roman settlement of modern day Colchester with the imperial agent fleeing to Gaul. They fought to London and to St Albans, storming the cities and sending the defenders fleeing. The Britons desecrated the Roman cemeteries, mutilating statues and breaking tombstones. The Roman governor of Britain at the time, who had fled with his troops into the safety of the Roman military zone, challenged Boudicca with an army of 10,000 regulars and auxiliaries. Win the battle or perish, that is what I, a woman, will do. You men can live on in slavery if that's what you want. It's a pretty good quote. The battle was a brutal defeat though, with Boudicca taking poison to avoid becoming a prisoner. Criminal to the Romans, but I mean, a hero to pretty much everyone else. Number 9. Nefertiti Kind of hard to call this a crime, but basically Nefertiti was the wife of the Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep IV. Being close to equal in power to her husband, as well as very influential in her own right, she and her husband did something quite scandalous. They decided to turn their backs on almost the entire pantheon of Egyptian gods, sort of. They made one god the prime god of Egyptian religion during their reign. That would be the god of the sun, Aten. They moved the capital of Egypt to a new location, which they named after Aten, and they even both changed their names. He became Akhenaten, and she became, give me a sec here, um, Nefer Neferatau, nope, Nefer, <laughs> Nefer Neferaten, Nefertiti. This is like a hyphen in there, I don't know. Both of those names, as you may have noticed, have the name Aten in them. Nobody liked this change and it was quickly reverted after they were no longer in power. It sure was scandalous though. Number 8. Anne Boleyn Honestly, for most of the wives of Henry VIII, it's a little hard to, well one, pick one, but also two, really know if any of the things they were accused of actually happened or if they were just easy excuses. But nonetheless, here we are, and since we haven't talked about any before, why not start with the second one, who was, was pretty much the catalyst for Henry VIII and England breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church and forming a whole new church resulting in the deaths of an eventual thousands of people. You see, divorce is strictly prohibited in the Roman Catholic Church, so when Henry met Anne, his wife Catherine, who had not produced him a son to carry his name, just kind of had to go prompting the whole damn reformation. Was it worth it? No, because the marriage lasted three years before she was charged with infidelity and incest and lost her head. God, I kind of feel bad for anyone associated with King Henry VIII though. Number seven, Queen Dida. Queen Dida of Kashmir was quite an ambitious queen mother. Dida seized complete administrative control during her husband's reign, ultimately becoming queen regent for her son and grandsons. That ain't enough for Miss Dita here. Mere advisory for her? No sir, she despised being just an advisor and well she disposed of all three of her grandsons using medieval forms of witchcraft and torture. Yikes. How dare they make Gma their advisor. Queen Dita got what she wanted at least, as she then reigned as monarch for 23 years, being in some form of power for nearly the whole of Kashmir's 10th century. And while she may have been more than a little brutal, she was honestly one of the best and strongest rulers Kashmir has ever had. Number 6. Queen Nandi Queen Nandi of the Zulu Empire has a story that literally sounds like it's straight out of a movie. Before the Zulu Empire ever came to become a thing at all, Nandi was impregnated by a Zulu chief in the 1700s, giving birth to a son they named Shaka. But being the third wife of the chief, she and her son were often ridiculed and shamed by other chieftains. Despite all that, Nandi raised Shaka to be an extremely fierce warrior. Shaka grew up to become the Zulu chief in 1815, and Nandi became the queen mother alongside him, known in English as the Great She-Elephant. 
She, alongside her son, wreaked havoc on those who had mistreated her and Shaka. But since Shaka remained unmarried, it was Nandi who, funnily enough, remained the power behind the throne of the Zulu Empire throughout her lifetime. She is the reason the Empire ever existed in the first place, and if any of what she did was a crime, uh, I kind of get it. In our number 5 spot today, we have Caterina de Medici. Caterina was an Italian noblewoman born into a famous family. She was Queen of France from 1547 to 1559, with marriage to King Henry II, and she was the mother of four future French kings. It wasn't exactly surprising news that her husband, Henry II, had a lifelong affair with a mistress, but on his deathbed, when he was begging to see his mistress, Caterina refused and left him to die, a lonely and painful painful death. Do I entirely blame her? No, but it's also a pretty heartless move, you know what I mean? The daughter of the queen, Margaret, was said to be rebellious, but her mother wasn't just going to let her get away with it. The mother and daughter would fight over the married daughter's extramarital affairs, and it is said that Katarina's scream could be heard echoing throughout the palace. One fight between the two even saw her locking her daughter up in a castle, never to see her again. In our number 4 spot today, we have Agrippina the Younger. Roman Empress Julia Agrippina of Rome was pretty spoiled. She lived a lavish life. Her husband was the emperor and she had a family, but that just wasn't enough for her and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, so she tricked her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing the Roman law so that they could get married. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died. Could be a really convenient coincidence or it could have been a totally planned hit. I'm not accusing anyone, I'm just telling you what the word on the street is. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had to force her out of power. Julia, as you could imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world she desired the most, and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow him, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. In our number 3 spot today we have Maria Eleonora. Maria of Brandenburg, the Queen of Sweden, has quite a horrifying story that relates to the birth of her daughter. Apparently, Maria wasn't feeling the overwhelming joy of childbirth because although she was hoping for a son, she gave birth to a daughter, Queen Christina. Maria wasn't shy about her opinion. She apparently screamed that she was given a dark and ugly daughter with black eyes. Okay, it's kind of rude. She referred to her new child as a monster and apparently just absolutely did not want anything to do with Christina and would have rathered that she just didn't exist. Apparently she even placed Christina to sleep next to the corpse of her father who had passed away. It's like a different kind of messed up. Things clearly weren't right with Maria. In our number 2 spot today we have Queen Isabella. Isabella co-ruled Spain from 1451 to 1504 with King Ferdinand II and during her reign she had some pretty horrific views and feelings. She wanted to get rid of all Spanish Muslims and Jewish people from her kingdom. Sounds a bit like another evil ruler from history. In 1492, she ordered that all Jewish people either convert to Catholicism or get thrown out of the kingdom. She made them all come to Spanish court to either pledge their faith to Catholicism or get exiled from Spain. How horrible is that? The queen has also been attributed with establishing the Spanish Inquisition, which definitely is not a historical highlight. Both Isabella and Ferdinand are often said to to have done great things for Spain, which in some cases is true, but at what cost and for what reason? In our number one spot today, we have Rana Valona I, the last queen of Madagascar. She ruled the kingdom for 33 years from 1828 until 1861. There is no doubt that she was committed to her kingdom and that she would do anything for it, but in this plight, she was cruel and violent. She initially came to power after the death of her husband, and once she had it, she was not letting it go. The queen was able to keep away the advances of the French and British and she left the bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. In 1845, the queen ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months. They were meant to have this massive buffalo hunt. Well, she clearly wasn't thinking everything through because 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion and uh, not one buffalo was hunted. Some records of history state that she even had her own uncle executed in order to protect her power. And there is an even more gruesome story. Some people even state that she ended her
her own mother's life by starving her to death. That is some epic level of evil, if it's true. Number 10 in our countdown is Julia Get a Grip Agrippina. When the Emperor Claudius' wife, Melissiania, became entangled in an adultery scandal, the power position of the Roman Empress was suddenly wide open in the year 49. Julia Agrippina, exiled for a conspiracy against her first husband and widowed from her second that she was believed to have poisoned, concocted a scheme. In an outrageous maneuver, she seduced her own uncle Claudius to become his fourth wife. She didn't stop there, however. She then had her uncle husband make the son she had had in her prior marriage, Nero, his heir by marrying him to his own daughter from his previous marriage. Oh, now that's that's quite a family tree. Taking the title Augusta, she maintained a stronghold over political and household affairs, considering herself a co-ruler to her husband. After Claudius died from eating poisoned food, which is how her prior husband died, so make the connection there, Nero became a Roman emperor and would forever change Roman history in his time of rule. However, Agrippina could only hover above her son for so long, and his annoyance of her invasiveness grew. Nero chose to assassinate his mother with a trap, a boat set forth on the Bay of Naples designed to sink. But when it did, she swam ashore. Nero changed his plans and had his soldiers invade her summer home to do the deed instead. Number 9 in our countdown may be one of our most badass queens, Empress Theodora, from street busker to top dog. Syrian born Theodora starts her journey as an actress, dancer, and mime alongside her two sisters in the late 400s, something she abandons by age 16 to be a mistress to a Syrian official. And she travels much of North Africa with him before his maltreatment and temper made her settle down in Egypt alone, where she took up wool spinning. It was here she met Emperor Justinian and the two fell in love. And after Justinian changed some laws so that they could marry, they began co-ruling the Byzantine Empire together. So what made her mad, you may ask? Her ideals and the smearing that they led to through history. She was historically known for supporting religious freedoms, women's rights, and the education of the masses. Her decisions, which reflected her opinions, led to the Nicaea riots of Constantinople. She intervened and was able to persuade her husband to stay. The two successfully quelled the revolt and in turn, she made Constantinople one of the most sophisticated cities in the world and promoted women's equity. Theodora's name appears in almost all the legislation passed during the period and she received foreign envoys and correspondence with foreign rulers. Her husband died in 1527 AD and Theodora took sole control of the Roman Empire. Under her reign, bridges, aqueducts, and churches were built. Theodora died of cancer on June 28, 548 AD. She and Justinian are both considered saints by the Eastern Orthodox Church. The She-Wolf of France is in number 8 of our countdown. Her actual name is Queen Isabella of England, and she was famously married to the closeted Edward II. Acting as a beard to someone who doesn't love you would be hard enough, but the two did also have to produce heirs together. One would be the future King Edward III. Queen Isabella was in a desolate and lonely situation, especially as her husband's two male suitors, Piers Gaveston, who he gifted her jewels to, and Hugh Dispenser, who was a wildly hated extortionist, were always his preferred company. So she rounded up some spiteful nobles, first killing Gaveston by beheading, and then driving Dispenser from the country and redistributing his wealth. King Edward unsurprisingly was upset and sieged against those who had contributed to the death and exile of his lovers, all whilst his wife took cover in the Tower of London. It's here she met exiled British traitor Lord Roger Mortimer and started her own affair. She had him broken out and sent to France where she later joined him and with her son, and then sent Edward a letter that essentially said, suck it. The anger at having been cast aside turned into burning desire for vengeance as Isabella invaded England with her new husband and army and upsurped the throne, where she and Mortimer then ruled until her son came of age and had her dethroned for her violent tendencies. She died 28 years later in retirement, and Edward III later went on to rule England for 50 remarkable years. Maria the Mad comes in at number 7 of our countdown. She was just 16 years old when she became the Princess of Brazil and the Duchess of Braxana, then their queen following the passing of her father. Brazil changed from just a Portuguese colony to a large kingdom. Brazil, the Algraves, and the United Kingdom of Portugal are three famous formations recorded under Maria the Mad and her son. After the death of the queen's husband slash uncle in 17 however, there was a noticeable decline in her mental health. 1788 saw the passing of her daughter, newborn son, and her closest confidant. By 1792, after the passing of her eldest son a year prior, Maria seemed to be experiencing a combined symptoms of hallucinations, depression, and anxiety, all resulting from mass traumatic losses. It evolved to later include religious mania and melancholia. She started avoiding court gatherings and social or royal obligation. It was then her treatment went to Dr. Francis Willis, who tried straitjacketing, blistering, and ice baths, none of which were helpful for 
obvious reasons. After treatment for more than five years, he declared the disease was incurable. By 1792, Maria was no longer a capable ruler and deemed insane. Courts pushed her son John to take over the government ruling, but he delayed until he finally took the throne in 1799 for a truly tragic reason. There was just no longer any possibility that his mother would ever recover her senses. If the nickname Maria the Mad wasn't already taken, then this next Maria named Monarch would have snatched it up. In at number 6 is Maria Eleonora of Bradenburg. Maria Eleonora was born in 1599 to Prince of Bradenburg and Anna, Duchess of Prussia. She grew up pampered, and Maria Eleonora was the it girl of the 17th century. All powerful monarchs fell over themselves to marry her. While she was dismissive of the 22 year old Swedish King Gustav Adolphus initially, in 1620 she changed her tune as she had apparently fallen in love with him practically overnight. And so they were married. With the king so frequently risking his life in battle, it became imperative that his wife produce a male heir. So Maria had to hanker down and focus on the baby making business. Maria experienced three stillborn children consecutively before the successful birth of her daughter in 1626. It was a rare break in battle, so her husband was there to excitedly greet his daughter. Maria, however, had a very different response. Her baby was born with the condition fleece lanugo, a condition where hair covers the body of a newborn. Her infant was enveloped from its head to its knees, leaving only its face, arms, and lower legs visible. Maria was horrified, claiming to have birthed a demon, and rejected her daughter for the decade to come, even after losing her husband in 1632 Battle of Lutzen. And while everyone mourns their own way, it's easy to say Maria really took it up a notch. She forced their daughter to sleep in blacked out rooms and reportedly hung King Gustav's heart in a golden casket on the ceiling above the bed, making the girl sleep directly under her father's blessed remains. In 1633, Maria Eleonora returned to Sweden with her beloved's embalmed body. She refused to bury Gustav for more than a year, reportedly embracing and caressing the decomposing king. Maria's story continues to become more demented with time and her daughter grows to become her caretaker, especially when troublesome Maria runs away to Denmark permanently and her daughter's left to become the queen and pay her mom's allowance to Danish royals. Awkward. Number 5. Bloody Mary. Duh. Mary the First, or Bloody Mary as she is also known, was the first real queen of Britain. But this reign didn't last very long, five years to be exact, before she was replaced by the much, much better queen Elizabeth. But in that short five year span, Bloody Mary earned that title, let me tell you. Mary the First ordered war against the Protestants and slew quite a hardy handful of them for heresy. Which is interesting since her father, Henry VIII, was kind of the guy who made Protestants more of a thing in England and then her sister was also Protestant and made it the main religion in England. History is full of people needlessly passing away because what they believe isn't the right thing. Anyways, to heat things up, Mary even had some of these Protestants burned on the spot. Some is kind of an unfair statement. You see, the queen here was responsible for burning over 300 Protestants at the stake. Other kings and queens burned people at the stake for their faith. I mean, Mary's father did it, as did her sister. But it's the sheer amount of people that make her much worse and much more famous. Number four, taking over. Queen Catherine the Great of Russia was obviously a queen of Russia. But that don't mean she was actually Russian. She was actually German born. But she was Russian to get herself into power when it turns out her husband, Emperor Peter, was not very liked by his own people, as he showed a very obvious dislike for Russia, which is kind of weird. She took advantage of people's disdain, and while she may not have directly done the life ending here, it is pretty well stated that the act was committed by her supporters, and public opinion held her responsible. She was called the Great, but it seems she was actually kind of the absolute worst, even if she was a strong ruler. She does look very proud of herself in a lot of her paintings though, which, I mean, she overthrew her own emperor husband and became ruler of a country she isn't even native to. So like, yeah, I guess, good job, I think. <laughs> Number three, La Loca the Loco. Finally, a queen not on this list for ending other people's lives. No, Juana La Loca was far worse than that. Not to be insensitive, but Juana La Loca was loco. She was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband died in 1506, her father buried his body, but that didn't stop La Loca from opening the tomb and caressing her husband's non-living body from time to time. Ultimately, she even ordered people to dig up the body fully, and she would kiss her deceased husband's feet. I'm sorry, excuse me, I need, I need some water after that. That's disgusting. Mm, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh good, we aren't done. Of course not. No, no, apparently, Juana would also carry his coffin everywhere with her and even kept it under her bed. 
It wasn't until years and years later she allowed his burial outside her window, finally. Look, I, I get loving somebody, but dear lord, imagine what she was like when he was alive. Stage 10 clinger, 100%. Number two, let them eat cake. How about a queen that caused the whole revolution? That's gotta be a good one. We have almost all heard of Marie Antoinette. She was well known for splurging on things she shouldn't have and the countless affairs and scandals she was involved in. Like the scandal of the necklace. Countess de la Motte pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. She fooled a member of high society in believing that the queen loved him, even going as far as to hire a lady of the night, disguise her as the queen, and convince the poor guy that Antoinette wanted to purchase a diamond necklace that cost 1,600,000 livres, which is almost 12 million dollars by today's money. The amount of sheer greed and debauchery that happened while she was around made her own people rise up and fight back against the unfairness of the French monarchy. Good job, you made your people hate you, cause y'all ignorant. Number one, Countess not Dracula? Born in Transylvania, because of course she was, in 1560, Countess Elizabeth Bathory of Hungary was a Hungarian noblewoman. But more than that, she was an extremely infamous serial slayer. She used her position of power to defend herself from ever having to suffer the consequences of the heinous crimes she would commit. Okay, well, name the crimes, Adam. Okay, I will. Elizabeth spent years slaying servants and peasants just because she wanted to and enjoyed it. She did it so much that her own husband, Count Nadasti, went so far as to build his wife a torment chamber for her to do this more comfortably. Great husband, horrible person. Elizabeth also had a nasty habit of actually feasting on her prey. She would often bite and eat chunks out of them while they were still alive, and in one case, she may have even forced someone to cook and eat some of their own body. Eventually, her conduct became so appalling that a trial was held. It only took forever to happen. She was convicted on 80 counts, but was only sentenced to solitary imprisonment within her castle. That's it. Like, how is that okay? I don't get it. She thankfully met her end three years later in 1614, but my lord was she a bad dudette. Not good. 